to what extent are, are some of these villains that show up in Destiny a little bit tone deaf? Because I've always thought like at a certain point it's getting a little bit of offensive. These aliens showing up and even for Kaito to be like Bow. It's like, have you have you been paying attention you know? to Destiny the past like five, you know, maybe 2014? <laughs> in 2014 when the Kabul was scary, when um, Valis to Ark was our biggest problem, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. the Kabul is scary, but this in 2021. Go out to Sat, see the hole in the ring, and see the corpse of the god that is now floating around <laughs> Sat. And Unless... tell me that you are someone who is capable of telling the Guardians to bow, right? Like, it's, it's totally true. I thank you once again for joining me. Um, this is episode four at this point. We've done a couple of these, but um, looking to do them a lot more regularly from here on in. So you should be uh, expecting to hear from us more often. Um, but we've got a brand new season, season of The Chosen. We've got Kaitel, we've got some Kabul stuff, we've got some Battlegrounds, much to talk about. Um, just want to say, of course, uh, as usual, appreciate all the support on the podcast, all the listeners on the on iTunes, on Spotify, on YouTube, on the clips, across all the board, wherever you're listening. I appreciate it, whether you're making a sandwich and listening or whether you're playing some Gambit, doing some bounties. Um, do all the algorithm stuff, like the video, you can subscribe to the channel, you can, I think, you can follow on Spotify and I think five stars on iTunes. It's too much, it's getting it's getting out of hand. There's too many, there's too many platforms. Can't Everyone even, needs like a universal system, don't they? I don't right? even keep up anymore with all the all the different algorithms working in, working in unison. How are you doing, mm -hmm. Mike? I'm doing real good. This last uh, season launch has been a really busy week for the channel, but uh, it's been really fun diving into a lot of the new stuff to go ahead and play. Yeah. And yeah, just generally feeling in a very nice place about things. Yeah, it feels, um, I'm not going to lie, I think this, this, this season feels a lot better than I expected. Like, obviously, there isn't a ton of stuff to do, but it feels like, I don't know, it, it seems as if it's not, it's not promising more than, it's not, promise, it's not pretending to be something it's not. Like Bungie mm -hmm. isn't pretending yeah. this this season's gonna be the the latest greatest you know forsaken expansion. Like it, we kind of know what to expect from seasons at this point. And um, honestly, from what I've seen, most people seem pretty just pretty like satisfied, just just whelmed. You know, not not overwhelmed, underwhelmed. Just kind of like you know, mm -hmm. it is yeah. it, it, it is what you'd expect. Although battlegrounds, I will say, battlegrounds is is impressed me a lot more than I expected. It's another another horde mode, another you know shoot mm -hmm. a bunch of enemies in a battlefield but it does seem I, th I think it's because of the cabal theme it's just something you know you can chuck on a podcast you can just grind away shoot some cabal is not too mechanic heavy apart from mm. throwing the balls that generators which is surprisingly <laughs> more difficult but um, surprisingly more dangerous right I, I i feel like everybody has at least once died to uh blowing themselves up alongside one of the generators by throwing a bit too close right? yes yeah, the only it's the only difficult mechanic in that but battlegrounds i'm liking what, what, what mm -hmm. are you thinking about the battlegrounds and the gameplay loop so far we'll get into the story stuff i'm i'm sure we've got much to talk about with the story and the characters but gameplay wise what are you thinking so i love it because it feels like cabal with the enemy density of the hive uh, which is really fantastic because it really does feel as though you're facing an army for once like if I'm sitting there with Eyes of Tomorrow, generally speaking, I can tag all but one of the enemies on screen in most normal encounters. By the way, haha, I'm sorry, sorry to brag, but I have the raid rocket launcher and it's bloody brilliant. Um, Isn't it yeah, nerfed though, uh, or like bugged? Oh, it's yeah, it's been it's been actually nerfed, but it still completely destroys. Yeah. Um, point being, in battlegrounds, uh, I will never be able to target everything with my eyes. Uh, and like I, I use that now as like my go-to for ad clear, and that's really fantastic for keeping it under control. But I use all my heavy ammo to do it. And uh, if I'm just do it going in there doing primary, it does feel like a constant struggle. And that's in a, in a good way. I think is worth stating. You know, like enemy density is a weird one in Destiny, but like they've actually got a really chunky number of enemies on the screen at the same time, and it really mm -hmm. feels like a big fight. So yeah, it's good. Do you think that could be possibly a next gen thing? Maybe that can cram more enemies or maybe it's the advantage mm. of what they're able to do i didn't think about that but yeah i mean it could potentially be a lot of people are transitioning to that new console um generation and if you're leaving ps4 and you know uh, xbox one behind the entire realm of possibilities start opening up when you've got hardware that is able to render games in like two seconds and throw you straight into the game world that quickly yeah it's fantastic with that two seconds of course i'm referring to 
Miles Morales, not Destiny itself, but like bar for speed. You know, you get what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. Keitel, we should talk about Keitel. What is oh, yeah. what is the deal with Keitel? She showed up. We heard about her a, a, this time last year. In fact, she was mentioned. She was mm. involved in was it the fourth Fourth Horseman? That was like Fourth her, Horseman and Heir Apparent. Yeah, those are the two exotics linked to her. She was involved in those. We heard. I mean, we even. We saw her in the Destiny credits. She's in the Destiny credits and the um, the Destiny 2 collector edition book, which was about, mm -hmm. essentially, obviously, it was about Kallus and his Leviathan ship, and it was explaining the um, the coup. The conspirators, he, the midnight yeah, coup. So he got backstabbed, and one of the, obviously, um, Gaul was a part of that and led it, but one of the members of that was Keitel. So... Pretty like definitely have to give props to Bungie for um what would you call it foreshadowing for this isn't just an enemy mm. that plucked out of nowhere this isn't I guess right. like Aramis this isn't the high celebrant right this yeah. is not the high celebrant from last season or even Titles Aramis to be honest because Aramis mm. as a beyond like, like she was what zero yeah, hour she, she was she, yeah she existed a bit in the lore prior yeah. to all of this but like nowhere near as much like potential history of name yeah. drops prior to this as someone like say Keitel. Yeah, but Keitel, like, like pretty good job for, for for mentioning and showing an image of the of the Keitel with the tusks um, in the in the 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 credits of the very first Destiny two the base game launch, and then to have a slowly mentioned, and then this time last year, and then to have a finally be an enemy in the game. So it's cool to see them kind of bringing in characters that are relevant and in the backstory. But tell me what you're forcing there, Keitel as a character as an enemy. Um, the more I read up on Keitel, the more I start to like her as a character that they've written, because the amount of stuff they've pumped into the lore for just this one season around Keitel is huge. I mean, she is in the new seasonal armors lore tabs in almost every single one of them, except I think the helmet. She, of course, has a, an entire lore book dedicated to her called Empress. She appears prominently in the other Cabal law book, which is all about basically the struggles of the Red Legion and I think the Broken Scout Legions when they come to Sol and after the Red War. Um, there's a whole load of references to her in some of the weapons that we've gotten. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's really revealing to her character. So, um, best example, uh, I think it's the Tarantula law tab. It's either Tarantula or Cartesian coordinate. Um, they actually mention a conversation between Keitel and Spider. And initially, it's one of these things of uh, Keitel accosts the spider as somebody who's a war profiteer. Uh, and then eventually, they agree to meet under the knowledge that he's going to go ahead and instead of selling her weapons, sell her information that she might find useful. And that exchange alone is really fascinating because it shows a few different things about her, just like the opening cutscene does. It shows that she has principles which she will happily put over potential gain in the immediate sense and then also after you've seen all of that go down you think to yourself you know i think that's the first cabal i've ever seen to have some kind of moral compass like that you know mm. she sits there and she could very easily gain advantage by closely allying with spider and negotiating and dealing with him but she openly chooses not to and it, you know again she's trying to create um uh, or at least, you know, her character appears to be attempting to create someone who has a very sort of honorable guise to them. And yeah. it's not one of these things of that honor for honor's sake. Like, she sees the genuine merit in it. You know, they know what she will do, but that's also partly its own kind of um, advantage. You know, if ever mm -hmm. she wants to come to the table and negotiate, they can, to a certain extent, think that there is some sincerity behind that, even with what Osiris says in that first cutscene, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's I I think the other thing that I got to go ahead and jump in and talk about is just I, this is going to immediately turn some people to sleep, but for me it's it's the kind of stuff that immediately gets me interested. Cabal politics. She's right in the middle of everything. I was about like, to say, and I mean yeah. absolutely everything. Like be it the Broken Scout Legions, Red Legion, Callus's old and now potentially abandoned subjects that are still in the system. Anything to do with the old Cabal homeworld of Toro Batal. Um, she just has her fingers in every single potential pie that's within the Cabal race. It's, it's, it's amazing to see because she really should be that character. She's the nexus of all the different Cabal sub-factions. So the fact that they've been able to portray that is really good. Um, another example from another lore tab. Um, 
the chosen are the people that she's obviously calling to her sides and the people that she's potentially giving a seat on her war council. Um, she is preparing a banquet for them, uh, and the cryptarchs actually translate um, uh, the recipe because they intercept the transmission for what they're going to serve at the banquet, and they actually give a little bit of postulation as to why. And it's not some opulent feast like under Callus. It's not some kind of thing that's designed to prepare everyone for battle like it might be an under Gaul. It's a really humble meal that's associated with the Cabal lower classes. And the reason she's doing that, the Cryptarchs suspect, is to create this very humble aura about her, which means that she'll be able to get the respect of her soldiers and the people who potentially might look to follow her. She, in every single way, is trying to be a pragmatic, smart politician. And that in itself makes her really interesting because she's not just another cabal warmonger. She actually has the ideas of her hearts and minds of her people at heart. And, you know, there is a genuine sense that this could be just her gaming the system very well, or it could be that she actually cares. And the reality may well be the latter. And all the more reason, too, considering that uh, the cabal homeworld, according to what she says in the first cutscene, it's lost. You know, like they've lost it somehow which uh, I presume is going to be revealed in the lore later, but I won't provide any spoilers mm. of stuff uh, for now because I honestly haven't read any. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned politics. That's also exactly what I was going to say. You can you can tell, I mean, the, the Cabal are the most political. The, the, the law of the Cabal as a race are based off of, like, Roman politics, mm -hmm. emperors, and this kind of theme. And you can, you can get that sense with this. And it's very, like, there's a lot of sense of, like, honor and, like, when you when you smash the chest and steal the loot, it's like, it's yours by law. It's very like, and even, yeah. like, even Zavala meeting her is, is very, it isn't, um, it isn't just, you know, aliens show up and you shoot them bad guy. It's, it's kind of, there's, there's a bit of diplomacy. There's negotiation. There's, I mean, right. even with the, I mean, it's even the with, honorable declaration of war, right? Yeah. Which is fitting with the, with the cabal. So pretty mm. like, like that all makes sense in terms of, um, like even the Zavala cut scene, how did, how did that even like come about? Because Zavala just like it is a bit strange to see this this big bad alien comes up who's most likely an enemy, not a, not a friend of the Vanguard, and then Zavala's like meeting with her on a ship. Like it's not something yeah. you'd normally see in Destiny. Just uh, two characters just chatting like that. And yet, that's part of why it's so good. Because Bungie, for all the wonderful stuff they do with the stories of their heroes, they often don't do as well when it comes to the stories of the villains, and that's almost as important, if not more important. In fact, I'd go ahead and say that um, Keitel is one of the better antagonists we've had in a while, partly because we actually sit there and see so much of her perspective. You know, we're able to we're able to take stock of who she is as a character and who she is on paper, without any affiliation to Cabal or Humanity or the Fallen, if you just described her character traits, you wouldn't necessarily assume that immediately she was a villain, mm. you know? And that's what's kind of amazing about her, you know? She sits there and uh, starts to express um, the kind of reliance and the need for allies in this fight versus the Darkness and the Hive. Uh, and that in itself means that she is a completely different Cabal from so many others. It's mm. We we bring up politics in this, but honestly, it's it, it's a thing of negotiation too, and it's a thing of like understanding the real depth to a person and their objectives that way. That's mm. why I think Keitel has done so well, is because you know the opening cutscene is not just her in some menacing thing. This is not her attacking and being like, "Ha ha, I am here to destroy you." It's like no, she's stated her goal, she stated her reasons behind all of that, and you can clearly see what she's doing and why you get a sense for things. And even when she blocks the sniper fire from her um, scions in mm. the back there, that's really telling too. Cause it's one of these moments of like, she is putting her life on the line and trusting the uh, people who are talking to her, AKA Cyrus and Zavala to be honorable and not to fight the minute that something goes wrong. Mm. You know, that speaks to so much more than just another cookie cutter villain. Like, yeah, yeah, it's part of the reason I really hope that Keitel doesn't die in this expansion. Because, mm. I mean, as I, or this season, rather, because aside from everything else, she has so much more to give than just a seasonal villain. You know, like, she could be a really fantastic character. Um, Bungie just needs to let her breathe, mm. basically. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's an interesting character, this character development. It's not a villain that's here and is dead on day one. It's mm -hmm. you like you're intrigued to see what's going to happen. Like there's this again, big bad cabal enemy, but she's kind of kind of trying to negotiate. She's clearly an enemy 
Um, we're clearly trying to fight her in these battlegrounds, yet we're also negotiating. Obviously, we're seeing those other cutscenes where we're going to meet her multiple times over, but it does make you wonder, where's this going to end? Is she going to end? Are we going to end up wearing her, her tusks as armor sets? Or <laughs> is she going to become some kind of ally? I mean, we've seen the whole ally narrative all over Destiny, obviously with the Fallen, which was slowly crept in. Now it's almost, since Beyond Light, it's, it's pretty much a given that we are allying with the fallen we've killed basically every single enemy fallen there is and all that's left is pretty much like yeah might as well let's just mm -hmm. join him so as we've, right. as we've said multiple times it's it's pretty much already there just barring being able to play as for any fallen or i mean we, we already fight alongside fallen multiple times it's just it's good to see and the cabal you would assume mm -hmm. are also going to do something similar but in terms of so keitel is callus's daughter where is Callus? Mm -hmm. What's he doing? That's the great mystery. No one is quite clear on where Callus has retreated to. Nobody uh, knows. The Leviathan went silent when the pyramid ships arrived in the season of arrivals yeah, he just and uh, has now fled. Yeah, Callus has dipped uh, and <laughs> nobody is quite sure why, but the Leviathan certainly isn't there anymore, which makes mm. Keitel's arrival all the more intriguing because you sit there and if you have that question in your mind, there is a chance that she either has the answer or is already looking for the answer as well. You know, so this is a, this is a strange shared objective, but for very different reasons. I imagine that for most people who have any relationship to Callus in the game, uh, it's this thing of, hey, this guy gives great loot along with his activities. And for Keitel, it's, this is my father. He is weak. He has always been bad for the Cabal. I will kill him honorably and end the stain of our house. And it's just like... Totally divergent requirements here, but like, man, what an incredible uh, story that that could potentially twist into. Mm. So On that note, um, Battlegrounds themselves, uh, we, we talked about politics, and I, I want to just touch on this one last thing, because you brought up the allies dynamic. Um, I think that has a real potential to go somewhere with the way that we're actually interacting with this. By smashing the tribute chests at the end of that activity and by defeating the... Uh, the various chosen that might ascend to Keitel's War Council. We are doing exactly as is stated in the opening cutscene of the helm. We're destabilizing Keitel's control over the Cabal. But in doing so, we also technically ascend to the role of her War Council, which is what's very entertaining, which means that in a strange way, we might actually do these activities, complete them by the end of the season, and have Keitel look at us and say, you are a far more worthy combatant than I expected. And it may make her reevaluate the whole thing of bow for this alliance, you know? It may be a thing of we'll enter this as equals, you know? And that might be something that I could see Zavala accepting. Maybe not, because, I mean, again, history with the Cabal and humanity has been somewhat riddled with conflict. Um, I, not to name anyone in particular, but Gaul knows what he did. Um, and yeah, it, it could be a really interesting platform towards moving relationships in one direction. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see where that goes in particular, because this actual muckery about with the Cabal stuff, it actually has consequences within the old, like, ancient rules of the Cabal, Cabal Empire. Mm. Like, the entire thing could lead to some really interesting narrative uh like places. I, I'm, I'm really fascinated to see what this does. Where would, so Callus and Keitel, they, I assume they would be enemies right now. Would they, would they get a lot of that? Are they still complete enemies or uh, because, yeah. because Callus is kind of, a, Callus is pretty much an ally of us kind of, and Keitel's mm -hmm. kind of trying to be, so, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Like if, are they both on the same page or, I mean, I assume they're not because she backs up. Yeah. But, um, so they are, I, the, the interesting part of that is really where Callus sits, but to answer the question really quickly, like, yeah, they are definitely enemies. Mm. Um, Keitel backstabbed him in the Midnight Coup, still believes that he's weak and still, for the most part, is the de facto ruler of what remains of the Cabal because, you know, she, she's deposed her father and that's not changed. Mm. Uh, Callus put out the, um, the booklet from the beginning of the, uh, uh, from Destiny 2's Collector's Edition, and that's really significant because in that he names her as a conspirator in the Midnight Coup and he says that she must die. And to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't changed because at the point in time when we killed other conspirators of the Midnight Coup, such as, say, Gaul, uh, Callus has rewarded us really quite handsomely with that. So I would think that uh, if we're sitting here and we're seeing all of this go down, you still have them as enemies. The really interesting part of the question, again, is Callus because... 
when the pyramid ships arrived, he went silent and now he's gone. And so mm. nobody really knows what the hell's going on with Callus at the moment. And that makes for a very interesting story. Right. It makes for this question of, has he realized that his apocalyptic view is wrong now that the darkness has arrived sooner than his prediction, now that it's thrown off everything that he wrote in the Chronicon? Well, him and his scholars. Is, is, is it the case now that perhaps he's doubled down on it? Because it's one of these things of, ha, I told you I was right about the apocalypse. I told you, I told you. And it's like, you know, now he's retreated because he's trying to find some other force. Maybe there's something going on where he's retreated and gone directly towards where the darkness of occupied territory is. There's, there's all sorts of questions about it. And sadly, we don't have a concrete answer. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're definitely not allies. They they will be at each other's throats if Callus shows back up. Maybe they should be. Maybe maybe we should all just be friends. You know, like hmm. the way I see it, I don't think I don't think they've got much. I think they've got more in common. Like why why not family family reunion and uh, get back on the same side? And we can all be. You know, how cool would it be to open up Destiny and you can choose what is it Guardian, Human Awoken, Exo, and then choose Fallen, and then Elixir choose Cabal, like. That would be that would be an ideal mm -hmm. world, and obviously the Vex will kind of always be enemies, and the Hive will always be enemies. I don't mm -hmm. think there's any ally yeah. with them. Although it is yeah. funny, the um, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the Zavala, the voice oh. actor, <laughs> the, yeah, the voice well, actor really. behind Zavala, reading out, um, which has gone viral, reading out uh, what was kind of a kind of a meme, but. Which was essentially along the lines of Zavala, what, what Zavala should have said to Keitel, mm -hmm. pretty much. But it's funny because it's true. It, mm -hmm. it, it kind of is, like, to a certain extent, to, to, to what extent are, are some of these villains that show up in Destiny a little bit tone deaf? Because I've always thought, like, at a certain point, it's getting a little bit of offensive, these aliens showing up, and even for Keitel to be like, Bow, it's like, have you, have you been paying attention you know? to Destiny the past, like, Five, you know, maybe 2014. <laughs> in 2014, when the Kabul was scary, when um, Valis to Ark was our biggest problem, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. the Kabul was scary. But in 2021, if you're mm -hmm. an alien, you're showing up to the like. Like, have you been? Have you seen a trait? Have you seen uh, heard of this guy called Oryx? Have you, right. have you heard of like you know? Go out to Sat, see the hole in the ring, and see the corpse of the god that is now floating around. <laughs> And Unless, tell me that you are someone who is capable of telling the Guardians to bow, right? Like, it's it's totally true. At this point, unless you're Savathun, I don't want to hear it. And even Zivu, like, she's got some, she's got to earn her own. But Savathun so far is the only enemy that has just, just made a laughing stock of the Guardians. She's actually won. She just beat the Guardians and is just like, she's winning right now. But she's the only mm -hmm. enemy, she's the only exception. She can, she's definitely, you know, very powerful. But all the other, all the other enemies are just like, yeah, I don't know. You you should you should kind of pay attention. Watch a couple watch a couple trailers and see what the guardians have done, and uh, maybe you shouldn't be showing up and asking us to bow. Almost a little yeah. offensive. I'm still a little cautious of Shivu, and I still rank Riven in that list. But you're totally you're totally right, dude. Like it's it it's crazy to me to sit there and see some of these enemies will just come along and attempt to be generic threats. Yep. It's like you do understand the track record here, you know? Like this 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 story has been told before and it doesn't end well for you like it's not good um you know it's why i like the kind of alternative threats that some of them can bring to the table so like amtech nobody knows who the hell amtech was but amtech is the fourth scion sister you remember the three scions from season of dawn they were the ones in the sundial oh, yeah. like those the bosses. Almighty crash. yeah she's the one who uh caused the almighty to crash and was going to crash it into the earth um that's an alternative threat that I can take seriously, you know, because you never see Amtech at all, but the Almighty was an ever-present thing, and by the end of the season, you actually saw the goddamn thing crash. You know, that's pretty fantastic as far as an alternate threat goes. Keitel's fleet does not scare me, because I know that fleet is made up of individual Cabal and Scions and Warbeasts, and uh, yeah, I've not found any problem killing any Cabal. <laughs> I, I've ever. not, yeah. you know, like... I hate to say it, but like Callus was a robot and he was probably the most challenging of the bunch. Galran was infected by the hive and he was pretty cool, but still fell. Like, you know, Gold. these are um Yeah, Gaul, Gaul. He's the only one that's done a done a decent job. <laughs> mm-hmm. took the light and still wasn't good enough, you know? Like Traveller said all no. Of this. Traveller sat down and was like, I, I apologize, but they're still gonna rave more about Valistark than they are about you. 
Like, I'm terribly sorry, but he's just more famous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Val- 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 Valas Ark is... It, 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 Guardians are more scared of Valas Ark than, uh, than a lot of these threats. Yeah, it's just kind of... I think that's important, though, when, when, when Bungie's introducing these villains. At this point, they need to kind of give us a reason to even be bothered about them, a reason to, you know, think they're a legitimate threat. And that's why someone like Savathun... I'm like just infinitely excited for because it's like oh I'm, I'm curious to see how it's going to unfold like how are we going to beat this enemy who so far is the biggest baddest enemy in destiny history that we have so far not even scratched not even seen yet she's just winning whereas when you introduce these characters when you look at Keitel no one's like oh no Keitel's gonna destroy all guardians but Savathun that's that's a story that you know you, you're waiting to see unfold but all the others are like yeah at this point you're gonna have to do you're gonna have to do a lot more than um you have to do a lot more than that. Mm. What I will say is that whilst to us, as an individual guardian who has literally killed multiple gods in their time, um, it's not a big threat. I do love that the tower and the apparatus around it is taking it seriously. And that kind of feeds into what I think is probably the best thing this season has done, which is to do with the helm and the team yeah. that's established to deal with Keitel, right? Mm-hmm. Vanguard operations are technically some kind of military operation being done with jurisdiction and code names, you know? When Operation Piccolo or Operation Storm Code or um, Operation in- Intrepid uh, go live, okay. you're actually running yeah, or Operation Oboe or something along those lines. Operation Baby Dog. When one of those goes live, you're you're actually part of a military operation with the Vanguard. It's never felt like it because strikes are so samey. Yeah. But when you jump into the helm and Zavala introduces every one of the team and says, these are their roles. You know, Amanda is on air support as she always is, a great pilot. Osiris is assisting in the and advising in the background because he no longer has a ghost and he is weaker than everybody else as a result. You've got um, Crow providing ground recon, which is a great role for him to jump into because, of course, he's a hunter and Saladin is leading the assaults generally because he's got experience with that. You know, this was the guy who organized the defense at Twilight Gap and were it not for you know, the fallen pressing so hard, he would have been okay, you know, and wouldn't have needed Shax to defend perhaps. But, you know, he has experience of this. He's an Iron Lord. Like, the fact that this team is assembled and you're at the center of it too, and you have your place in it, it feels really good because it feels like for the first time you're part of a special task force, Mm. which is realistically what the Vanguard should be doing for big threats like this. And like, I like that as well because this is reminiscent of the Red War. You know, like a last Yeah, the last time a Cabal fleet this large showed up on our doorstep, it meant the Traveler getting captured by the cage, it meant us all losing our light, it meant us losing the city for about two months. And that's, you know, the repercussions of that are still being felt in both human and Cabal terms. They are taking this seriously, as they should for a threat of this magnitude. And I think that's a credit to the story, because it gets that scale correct. You know, the helm is not something they've brought online for the High Celebrant, because the High Celebrant was an odd threat being investigated by you, Osiris, Crow, and the Spider. You know, it was concerning to Spider and you're sent after it in the first place because he's losing his Glimmer shipments on the Tangled Shore. This this concerns the whole system and all of humanity at large, and it's being mm-hmm. given the appropriate reaction, you know? Yeah. I, I do really enjoy that, and that's why I feel like the kind of base storytelling of this particular season at least in terms of the feel of what you're trying to do has felt so cohesive you know Mm -hmm. like there is a narrative here of what's going on and what you need to do and what your role in the plan is and all of those pieces fit together perfectly yeah it's just yeah can't speak enough good stuff about that yeah i agree yeah the helm feels it again circling back to just the theme and the cabal war theme they're trying to tell it, it all fits in having this kind of war room base of operations it does feel like you're actually part of, instead of just being an errand boy guardian feels like you're actually part of the war effort and even the battlegrounds it does like it, it fits the theme of that kind of trench warfare and these like how real war is especially more back in the old days but you have these actual locations where there's conflict obviously it's not it's a bit more one-sided it's us just floating around mm. with war mine cells and Skyburner's oath and just murdering Kabul. It's it's, it's, it's bit a uh, bit bit one sided, but it, it does feel like mm-hmm. there's these actual um, isolated little pockets of war, and you're doing something. It, yeah, it feels more a lot more cohesive than um, than say Wrathborn hunts or most seasonal yeah. um, you know arena type things. So yeah, just like and the bosses have in. like a stated role too. Like 
Th this is the other thing, okay? High Celebrant may have been making the Cryptolifts and may have been making an army for Shivu Wrath, but I have no idea what the High Celebrant does in the grander scheme of like Shivu's entire um, apparatus for things, aside from maybe making that army. If that's their role, that's great, but I don't even know what I can gather from the term High Celebrant, given the Hive's different culture. But when someone sits there and says, these people are ascending to potentially become part of Keitel's War Counselor, you sit there and you understand how important it is to take out these commanders because these mm. are the future generals. You know, yeah. these are the future leaders of the cabal, and that gives you context to the bosses you're fighting. It's not just generic fallen wrathborn number four hundred and eighty-seven. It's this guy is a cabal, but he's a cabal who has ascended to this rank, and mm. one point he could command thousands, he could command legions, and that's good. You know, like sure, I'm reading into that a lot because it's one of the things that I do as a guy who's very into the law. But it's it feels like there's more purpose, and that's. That's, you know, that's what's important at the end of the day. Like mm. having purpose behind a boss makes it that much more effective. Yeah. Yeah, it's just good to see, uh, as we say all the time, uh, the story, there's one thing you can guarantee is good in Destiny is the story and narrative, which is almost opposite of uh, of Destiny's launch in 2014, where that was one of the biggest complaints. But, you know, obviously, mm. depending on how much you've played Destiny 2, you might be getting bored of the gameplay loop or the core activities vanguard crucible gambit but one thing that's almost guaranteed is just the actual story the narrative is is very mm. cool and impressive how much they can flesh it out is limited i do wish like i wish i wish i wish they could just do tenfold more cutscenes. i just want so much more cutscenes because mm -hmm. as i'm sure yep. you are well aware there is so much good story in destiny that is just that the average player is never going to see and the average player isn't going to go onto bungie.net and read the huge huge long blog posts or read the lore tabs the best you're going to get is trying to follow the story and going on and watching my name is Bife on youtube and trying to get more information but just the cutscenes, every single cutscene in destiny they're just so well made and even if there were more mm. obviously obviously i'm backseat uh backseat game developing here but even if there were the simpler more animated the, the sketchbook style that you see just, I, I think this game could just do. I think a lot more of the players would be so much more interested in the story if there were just loads more cutscenes. Like even gameplay yeah. is cool, but cinematics would be so cool to mm -hmm. see more of. I think the other thing that's really um, gone well to the credit of both this season and previous ones are the moments when you're physically in an environment, you are using your guardian, you're moving around, and then uh, the characters address you and they're talking physically in the environment. You know, one of the better parts of the storytelling in Beyond Light the uh, dialogue bits between you, the extra stranger, and later on as you acquire more stasis parts, Elsie's sister, Anna, which is really fantastic because you ultimately get these fantastic moments of actual character development where Anna is at first really quite amazed to see her sister is alive and then just leaves because of the revelation of they're using stasis and you're using stasis. And mm. I, don't need, I don't know what to do about this. I need time to think. You know, those are fantastic moments. But it's also brought to life because of the fact that it's not necessarily just in a cutscene. Like you can actually see the characters in front of you, and that's I think the other side of what Bungie should look to do. And they already did it this season at the very beginning. Um, the conversation between Crow and Osiris. If people missed that, you've missed out on something really fantastic because that um, discussion between them not only tells you why, if you somehow missed the memo, Crow is wearing his mask, but also is just another really great example of just them fleshing out characters and giving them development and growth during tangible scenes. I think that's the reason why it works so well is because it is tangible. You know, mm. the characters are there in front of you and they will look at you and address you. And yeah, admittedly, there's a range to this, but like to a certain extent, you know, they will track you within a small radius as long as you're not like standing in a silly position. Like mm. if you're over on a shelf, they're not going to look at you. But like within that small radius, it does feel like they're directly addressing you. So yeah, that's that's really good. Like more of that stuff generally and more of this storytelling um, outside of the vendors and outside of um, text dialogue, that's all really good. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm very, very pleased to see more of that. Yeah, the crow especially. The crow is probably the mm. highlight of one of the most interesting characters in Destiny right now, and thankfully so because he was hyped up. He was easily one of the most, one of the characters people were the most interested in to see what's going to happen with this guy. That's been, I mean, he he's one of the one of the oldest characters in the Destiny universe. One of the first ever shown off when he was called the crow back in the original mm -hmm. supercut, and Old Jim yep. was a big character, and he's just. 
it, his story arc in Forsaken made everyone a lot more interested. And so it's good to see that they're, they're, do, they're doing him justice. It took a while. There was a good, like, what, two years of two pretty years much nothing. Of we got yeah. maybe, like, one law tab in a dawning ship for, like, <laughs> just, the, just the title. So just remind, remember the Aldrin is still, still character. but Still out there, still kicking. The way they're doing him is, is, is impressive. Like, his voice lines, the Harbinger and Hawkmoon missions, just mm, seeing his yep. little hidey hole, like, really... As as we predicted that they would do, making you feel sorry for him and making you uh, the, the the way they've his redemption arc, which we yeah. said many podcasts ago, like his redemption, you can just see so clearly, just everyone trying to slowly forgive him and people. Osiris is um, helping him out, and it's only a matter of time before the moment that we all were waiting for is for the rest of Vanguard to to notice him and see what happens when when they realize that oh you're you're back but you're a new character. Right, but and yeah. uh, I, I, I've got to say this as well because it's one of the times when, very clearly and in such a brilliantly done way, over the last season, they gave Crow an arc. You know, he starts out as Spider's enforcer, who's kind of almost timid, and is just sort of trying to hang on and make sure that Glint is okay, and is just sort of there helping out, and is really glad to be alongside a fellow guardian. But you know, he's kind of lost, and eventually, by the end of the Harbinger mission, when you complete it. Um, and you get your alternate dialogue for it, you hear him saying, I have a purpose now, I am a guardian, and I am a weapon of the traveler, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's gone from this thing of, you know, floating and adrift to, I have a purpose, and I have agency, and I've chosen this purpose. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see that development even in the Hawkmoon exotic quest, the first one before you do Harbinger, because, you know, he makes the commentary being like, I don't know how I feel about being something's cosmic plaything. I don't like it. And eventually, slowly, he comes to an understanding of what he's meant to be and what he is and what mm. his destiny is supposed to be. It's, yeah, it's a beautifully done job. And that's just over one season. But what I think Bungie's doing that's really good is they're very clearly taking Crow and they're pushing him as, a, uh, as something that is going to be a consistent pillar of storytelling throughout the year. And if they do do that, that's going to be a fantastic thing because you've got Crow in a position where he can eventually grow into the universe and you can carry the story effectively with him. You know, like there are very clearly three pillars to the seasonal story being Crow, the hive story with Shiva, Wrath, and uh, Savathun, and the darkness. And Crow being one of those pillars means that he needed a good story and a good arc. And They've done just that. Like it's really great stuff. Like hats off to Bungie. Mm -hmm. Season of the Hunt may not have had great gameplay stuff. You know, Wrathborn hunts may have been repetitive as hell and not really that engaging. But man, the uh, the stuff with Crow has been really good to see. Like good job. Hats yeah. off. Yeah, and it's a cool parallel because you got meanwhile the Guardians are delving into the darkness and messing with things they shouldn't. He is delving deeper into the light. So you've got just the complete opposite. It's, it's kind of funny when you think about like, the Guardians are like <laughs> the big shiny example of what to do. And it's like, what, what are the Guardians up to? Oh, they're on Europa just messing around with the darkness. And mm -hmm. is, isn't that the entire enemy of Destiny is to fight the darkness, the bad guys? Yeah, and the don't Guardians know with them. That. And meanwhile, <laughs> Aldrin, who was the previous bad guy who was kind of, you know, not part of the darkness, but definitely, you know, not a, it wasn't a Guardian. And now he's the good guy. It's just complete, complete opposites, complete parallels. Do you think? Um, do you think Crow is going to end up being the vanguard, which we've, we've we've talked about many times before? But what what are you thinking about that? Do you reckon it's? Um, do you reckon that's looking likely? Do you reckon he'll be the hunter vanguard? I think that's all but um, guaranteed. And the reason I say that is purely because he's at the center of the operation right now. Like mm. him being one kind of kind of the, is yeah already right like. Unofficial. Him being one of the five figures within this, you know, the story, including us, Saladin, Zavala, Amanda, Osiris, and then there's him. You know, it's it's one of these things of not only is he filling the role of a hunter really well, not only does he seem like he's found his purpose doing it, but also the characters around him are learning to trust him. And, you know, it's things like his conversations between him and Amanda and uh, whenever he's talking to Saladin. These are moments when they're going to slowly start to get to know his character and he might either change their minds or he might be in this position where at least they will understand that he is truly a guardian. Mm. And with that, there may come a day when he is forced to remove the face mask and everyone will see, oh God, it is the resurrected Aldrin. And he's going to say, I know, I know I did something bad. I don't know what it is, but trust me, I'm the same crow you've always known. 
Mm. And when they hear that, that may be a point at which all of a sudden they realize that they can't trust him. And yeah. if you were sitting there having the debate of is it Aldrin or is it Crow, they have probably, you know, they will sat there and they will be exposed to that exact same debate in their heads right then and there. Mm. And they live in this un this fictional universe, you know, like they understand more accurately than anyone that Aldrin is dead and that Crow is a person unto himself, you know? Mm. That's uh, that's what's really exciting, I think, is uh, how that narrative arc is going to eventually unfold itself, yeah, and how Crow is eventually going to take his place as Hunter Vanguard. Yeah, it's definitely an identity narrative that Bungie's telling. I can I can imagine if I was if I was to predict probably some kind of scene where he ends up saving us. Maybe maybe this season with Keitel, where he ends up doing something heroic, saving us. A lot of people see and witness. And then everyone's like, oh, this, 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 this crow guy is a good character. And then he removes his mask and everyone's like, oh, it's Aldrin. So you see him do something good. Everyone is like, oh, we like this character. And then he's like, oh, surprise, I'm Aldrin, <laughs> guy that killed Kane, <laughs> but not really because it's kind of different person. It's like, that's the old me. So it's kind of proving that, you know, you can, that, uh, uh, that he can, he, he can turn, turn a new leaf and become a new character, I guess. Yeah. Bungie dropping Amanda into the story for this season and having her and mm. Aldrin chit chat as much yeah. as they do. Yeah, that's those... a genius choice because at the end of the day, she's going to be one of the major, um, one of the main <laughs> of all the people to be affected by Cade's death. Cade and Amanda were really good oh, friends. Yeah. She was physically angry oh, when wow. she wasn't sure about the fact that you or Petra had shot him. And she was like, tell me you shot him instead of Petra. In fact, oh, no, wow. I get it. Don't worry, I won't ask, but I'm just glad that he's dead, right? Amanda was one of Cade's closest friends, and if Crow convinces her and basically is just gets her seal of approval, that's almost a little bit like saying, "Yeah, I, you know, as a general result, emotionally, we should be okay to touch these feelings and let them go." Um, these feelings of anger towards who Aldrin was because Aldrin's not there anymore, you know? Like, that in itself is a really good choice, and I really hope they nail that one. Like, yeah, I, I yeah, really, really looking forward to any interactions they have because obviously as time goes on, all the characters get new interactions to them. So, yeah, it's mm. really good. That's a great point. I, I hadn't actually realized that because I heard the, um, the dialogue of Amanda and Crow where she was where he where he was again about the perspective thing he mm -hmm. was kind of That's like um kind of sympathizing with the fallen saying oh like how can you how can you be so mean he's basically like oh how can you be so mean and brutal to the fallen like i've i've eaten with them and they're not they're not so bad essentially and she's basically with her perspective obviously the fallen are bad guys the cabal are bad guys so that was kind of interesting but and realized that yeah she was she was a good friend of cade so them two talking is actually pretty funny yeah i hadn't clocked that mm -hmm. That's yeah. interesting. It's why this is so genius. It's just, yeah, I, I can't, I don't have enough good stuff to say about where this could go because mm -hmm. the potential foundations that they're laying here are really strong. I just hope that they manage to exercise them, which I mean, in season of the hunt, they did a pretty good job. So I have a lot of faith that season of the chosen is going to, you know, build on that narrative and it's going to mm -hmm. go really well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like we say, the story, the story of Destiny is good right now. It's uh, it's definitely by far the most thi the, the thing I'm most interested in these days. Just seeing where is this going, what the character is doing, who's what 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 the interactions. Obviously, somebody who's been playing a very very long time. The the day to day, the gameplay, the activities, it's nothing new. So it it does get a little bit stale. But the story, mm -hmm. the, the 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 story in Destiny will always interest me. Just seeing what the character is doing, how it's unfolding, and only because they're doing a really good job with it. They're paying off things that. We've been, um, we've been, we were wishing were a thing back in 2014 and 15. Like if we, if we, right. if we would have seen cutscenes like this, it would have blown our minds back then. So that perspective mm -hmm. is not lost on me. Again, like I always say, the the story is the story is one of the strongest points. Although it doesn't, it doesn't do, it doesn't do itself justice in highlighting itself with enough, I think, cutscenes and cutscenes and dialogue. But where it does show itself, it's it is it's very impressive. I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What do you think about um speaking of characters, Akora Ray? Where is she? <laughs> What's her ah, deal? Has so, there been any has she been mentioning law to add anything? Yeah, she's been kind of in the background. There is some law. Uh the guiding site is one of the Iron Banner pulse rifles, and she's mentioned very briefly in that law tab. It's Saint 14 talking about the role of trials and about the fact that he's kind of 
getting very weary of it. Um, she's also been Wait, mentioned- Wait, Sable is getting weary of trials. Yeah, it's one, it's one of those things. He, he approaches her about it, and uh, they have a very interesting conversation. Um, but the I think the real telling thing for her uh, comes well. There's two. There's two places it comes from. The first is like a bit of dialogue, um, uh, which you actually sit down and get at the end of Beyond Light uh, with her character, uh, and it's basically talking about how she's got some anger to her. You know, like there's a lot of. I need to look up what that was exactly, but um, as a character, she's very sort of discontent right now. But the cool thing is, you can see that discontented nature and the disagreements that she's got with Zavala at the moment from a law book which discusses a hypothetical future. And for those of you who don't know what I'm referring to, it's the Dark Future Law Book, which you get during Beyond Light. And oh my, that law book is spectacular. Um, if you've not seen it, uh, the addendum to this is that this disagreement between her and Zavala, and you know, the sort of continuous uh, conflict between them, the sort of friction, ultimately is something that helps lead to the fall of the tower, the fall of the city, and her death at the end of the day. Like Zavala appears in the law book. For those of you not read it, you know, this is big spoilers. Um, but yeah, in this alternate timeline that the Exo Stranger comes from, Zavala approaches the Exo Stranger, Anna Bray, and Rasputin, who is in an Exo body at this point. And he's on crutches. And he's on crutches because Savathun tore off one of his legs during the assault on the tower, which is called the bombardment. The city has fallen, and the tower gets brought down, and Ikora dies in the moment of the tower being destroyed and brought down upon the Guardians. And, you know, humanity is defeated, the Traveler flees. And this is why that Ikora question is so relevant, because ultimately we see that in another timeline, these kind of divisions between the Vanguard that have mm. sort of been festering, Didn't and these well. moments where she's starting to fray a little bit from Zavala, it does, yeah, it's not ended well at all. And uh, yeah, it's just very important that we go ahead and keep tabs on Ikora, because her side of the story and even her side of the Vanguard is very important. You know, she's basically the spy master at this point. She controls the hidden. Mm. So it's, yeah, like I, I'm really interested to see where that goes, but I have a feeling that that's going to be more of a question to be answered when Witch Queen and some of the future stuff with that comes along. Yeah, I always think about in during the Red War when Akora is like desperately asking asking the Guardian to save uh, Io because it's so like precious to her. And then mm -hmm. thinking, <laughs> because that was such a big deal, she was like the, the emotional cutscene, probably one of the best ones, like a very, very good example. But she's like trying to get you to save um, Io from Ghoul. Um, and then you and then you flash forward to now and the pyramids just <laughs> deleted Io. So she's probably extra, extra sad about that. But I mean, it's, it's a, a lot of people are speculating it could be a, a voice actor thing as well, while we're not even hearing from mm -hmm. her. Because obviously Gina Torres is a very high profile voice actor um very good one so it, it could be some kind of scheduling issues or yeah it's it's something they've discussed before is that they don't always bring the entire cast of destiny actors in for every season mm -hmm. and the reason of course is not just scheduling it's also a budget thing they'll they'll basically be like who are the central characters we're focusing on expensive yeah exactly right mm -hmm. i mean the fact that we get lance reddick as much as we do i think is kind of a blessing in yeah, that regard you can tell he loves it yeah, he, he absolutely loves, he, he adores it. I mean, he wouldn't be responding to the memes yeah. if he wasn't. Yeah. But like, you know, it makes sense that they uh, rotate in and out the cast of characters as a result. And um, I think also when it comes down to it, they have to be uh, careful with when they specifically choose to deploy uh, their characters like Jean Torres. Um, you know, it's, I think it's one of these moments where you want them to be really effective. And it's why... Um, the choices of the voice actors for this season being, you know, Zavala, Saladin, Crow, Osiris, and Amanda, it makes such a great deal of, well, and Keitel, I guess, as well, but it makes such a great deal um, of, of uh, it, it's a big deal they've got as many as they have. And it tells the bigger, like, effort that's going towards weaving that story together, you know? Like, mm. in this season alone, there is a lot of stuff going on on the voice acting front, and that tells me that they are really putting the effort in with this. Um, but yeah, if you don't see every character every season, don't don't worry about it. It's uh, it, it, honestly, 
if you're sitting there and you're thinking as a Destiny fan, like, man, I really hope they haven't just forgotten about this. I think in these instances, it's completely fine to say, like, yeah, they 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 are leaving certain stories to lie for a little bit while they tell other ones. Mm. And I think that's fine for the moment. Yeah, Drift is another example. He's one that's <laughs> you know, he's seen a lot of screen time before, so I don't think we've heard much, if any, th- anything from him this season. But it's it's to be expected, I guess. They they do them in rotations in in, in periods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also um, it's really good considering that him and uh, Eris with both season arrivals and beyond light had their parts to play. I feel like there's a good place for them all to be basically. And I mean, you know, that's the other thing to remark on. I hate to bring it up cause it's still a bit of a sour topic, but the Rona has affected it. Um, do you remember the story from beyond light about how they couldn't get the uh, voice actor for the drifter in? Yep. And so they played yep. with the idea of uh, Nolan North, voicing the ghost and yeah. like imitating the drifter throughout the mission. And they, mm-hmm. they went with that in the end because they couldn't book the actor. Like that's another factor that we have to consider. And it is one of those real world limitations that Bungie is just happening to work around. Yeah. And sometimes it's going to work out really well. And other times they've just got to adapt their story to what they can. Yeah. So I can, I can definitely be forgiving at least in this period of time, especially considering the studio is still working remotely on all of this. Yeah. But they're just getting the, um, the actors to do what they can for the time being. And if they have to do things via text as a bit of storytelling, that's just kind of the way it's got to be for the moment. But yeah, like thus far, the effort they've thrown at this and the amount of acting they've got done with all of the different things, phenomenal, fantastic, so mm. much. Yeah, Good. something we, we it's easy to forget about because it's been going on for so long, but it, it is like, oh yeah, Bungie, like, well, any game development studios, but especially Bungie, is not operating in a normal fashion. They're all still working from home. Like again, it's been so long. You kind of just forget that it's that it's that it has been. There's no no game development studio has ever been designed to work in this fashion. So they're they're making up as they go along, and it, it is still impressive that we got Beyond Light for what it was as a you know a launch fully expansion did get delayed but um yeah. the fact that we're even getting any new content or any games in the whole industry is always impressive so um yeah it is always it is always something else i forget about so, oh yeah we are we are in uh, un- unprecedented times i will say right. one thing about um one thing i think the season has definitely done well is the loot which Ooh, i mean yes. arguably because this is just in sheer volume like the amount of actual new weapons granted a lot of them are reskins um but at this point this is it's, it's, it's kind of bound to happen but um in terms of actual amount of new mainly weapons new perks new tweaks there is probably more arguably more actual loot especially obtainable for most people than even last even with beyond light and season of the hunt in terms of actual guns that was one of the biggest complaints with um with beyond light the actual amount of loot was pretty small um mm-hmm. The raid comprising of probably half of it, and there's the Europa set. But besides that, it was kind of there wasn't a whole ton. But this season, for only a small season, is yeah, it's decent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the nice thing is as well that a lot of that has gone into targeted farms. So, for example, if you want um, the 120 Gambit hand cannon, you're going to go ahead and play Gambit. That's um, bottom dollar, I believe. It's yeah, called. yeah. I got one if of those. you want to go ahead and get um, Shadow Price, that's one of the strike specific weapons you can get your adept versions too like these are really good like i'm i'm really pleased to see what bunchy is doing with all of this stuff because honestly at the end of the day like the loot is what drives a lot of these activities i wouldn't care as much about battlegrounds if it wasn't for the fact that i was getting my new gear and i was gearing up with those weapons and like a lot of those are chase items for me i really want to make sure that i've got good versions of those weapons so yeah, I mean, there's a lot to do with all of this, and the loot side of it is definitely worth chasing. Mm. Um, I'd also say, like, it's a credit to the fact that they're able to bring in so many new perks that are able to fix things up. They finally added new rocket launcher perks, which I think is a good step. I feel like still there needs to be a little bit more as far as um, some weapon archetypes are concerned, but like the way that they're running with things right now, I feel like it's in a very good spot. You know, yeah. you've definitely got a lot of weapons that feel fantastic. And also, can we just talk for just like even a minute about Taiku's divination? Like, as far as exotics go, the, uh, is that Taiku, the Nighthawk for the striker? No, nah, it's the new bow. It's the oh uh, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That thing is ingenious. That it's, thing's it's, really cool. I really yeah. like that. 
I do love when Bungie takes an exotic like that and just basically runs with this crazy concept and is able to execute it in the way they do. You know, yeah. like auto tracking arrows in the first place mm -hmm. are completely nuts. The fact that they do less damage because they're split between different targets, fantastic, sure, like whatever, that's a bit of utility that you can use. The fact that then you can shoot your second arrow and detonate those mm -hmm. targets for massive damage, oh my gosh, I did not see that happening the first time I played through with it. But when I realized what was going on, all of a sudden I realized that I had this massive thermite launcher in my hands. And I mm. thought, okay, let's have some fun with this. Yeah. This is the, this is the kind of fun weapon design that brings me back to things like Ruinous Effigy. Like, it's really good. I'm very happy with the exotics like this. I'm and, so uh, upset about Ruinous Effigy, by the way. <laughs> about its How's nerf. That? I do miss that weapon. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. I'm with you there. I'm with you. It was killed before its time. Mm. It was like one, what you one season. It lasted one season. <laughs> I mean, I think it was one of the most unique and cool exotics in Destiny. To, like, it was such a cool weapon to be able to right. be a trace rifle, and then you drop this relic that, that you weapons. can you can shield, you can melee, you can slam. It's such a cool, such a cool concept. You it's a shame it's not multiple ruinous effigies with one person using the relic to create big damage on a target. If you want, so unique. You know, yeah, it opened up possibilities to run double special builds because you would use the artifact as like a fourth weapon. So like your special ammo was always there because you were just killing things with the relic instead. Like the, it's such a, I, I think um, uh, Rami, who's a, a indie dev uh, and like very prominent figure in the game industry who also happens to play Destiny, put it really best when he said that it is a very bungee weapon. And he described all the unique things that Ruinous Effigy does I can't help but agree because there are just those weapons that are just, hey, this is a gun, but it also does all these wacky things underneath it. You can just like list everything that mm. this thing does, you know? Like, yeah, some things are really straightforward and, you know, water cliff coil. You know, it's a rocket, the rocket's track, big explosions, cool, great. Ariana's Val, it's a big hand cannon and the hand cannon has piercing bolts, great, cool. Ruinous Effigy, yeah, this thing makes, is a weapon that makes another weapon that you could use as a shield or as a weapon or to dunk dudes, and you can use the weapon with your standard weapons with your fire team to create more damage versus a target, and then you can run this particular setup with the weapon because it also does void damage, mm -hmm. which means you can get stuff. Like, all of these factors just feed into Bungie creating these crazy designs. I'm trying to think of other ones that are as crazy as Ruinous, but like, it you sticks know, Tiger's Donation, Trivity Ghoul, those are good examples, I think. Yeah, yeah. to me, it's easily one of the most unique it's just uh yeah i used to, I, I i it was pretty much glued to my character it was the only thing i used in season of arrivals that with um the um nezarek sin devour mm. like it just it, the, the the combos were so good they changed nezarek sin a little bit they it's no longer like the way that the buff refreshes is a little bit kind of nerfed i believe I'm not sure if they tweaked yeah. it but it like adds i think two seconds instead of just refreshing it to 20 i think yeah it like takes it, it takes um takes a lot more actual concentrated usage of void energy to build yeah. up that stack. Yeah. Which, granted, fair enough, because Nezarex could be a little bit ridiculous on some solos, but, I mean, Ruinous is still kind of ridiculous for yeah. that. So, I mean, they've not really thrown that to the ground too much. It's, yeah, it's good. Like, ah, oh, man. Yeah, exotics. Bungie weapons. Exotics, mm. uh, that, that's, that's another thing Bungie are... They've got a pretty good track record with, especially in, in I mean, launch Destiny 2, the exotics were pretty bad. They were they mm -hmm. were mostly they were very novelty, very just gimmicky, right. not very good, but this since runner was like Forsaken, out. exotics have just been they're just, they're the most powerful, interesting weapons. The bow is is such a cool looking gun gun. Such a cool looking weapon where you can just kind of like you can just like feather you have to you have to pull back at all. You can just feather the trigger. And then it'll track, and then as long as you get them burning, then when you kill them, it'll do the big explosion. Um, yeah, it's just such a such a cool, and obviously the the Titan chess piece, which is basically Nighthawk for strikers. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a thing. Speaking of, speaking of other bungee guns, and this kind of leads on to a topic that's relevant to this season. I gotta say, like the other thing that I really have to mention is Salvation's grip. You know, like creating a stasis crystal that freezes a dude seems underwhelming for a heavy weapon, and on its own it is. But it's the things you can do with those stasis crystals that you're able to then shoot that really makes it fascinating. When you're mm. running that with stasis as a titan, you can freeze a dude, even a big dude, slide into them, and then they will die because they'll be frozen. 
and you're using that aspect, which means that you break stasis crystals or frozen enemies if you slide through them. And then you've got the considerations of fragments, like you now have a fragment where if you're close to a stasis crystal, you will take less damage, which is crazy. Is one? Yeah, it's one of the new ones. Yeah. Uh, it's 25% um, damage reduction, according to, I want to say it's Fallout plays, and um, Drewski, I think, did the testing, but yeah, it's 25%. Uh, and you know you've got other things like if you break these stasis crystals, you will do more damage to them in significant areas, and it's just like a completely different take on how you make your elements interact with what you're doing. Like that's really fantastic, and the way that the new stasis stuff, uh, which they've added new aspects of fragments, of course, like yeah, that's also at least in PVE terms, I'm very excited <laughs> to see that come along. But uh, <laughs> yeah, stasis <wow>. is. <laughs> Uh, it is. Uh, Should we talk about the crucible? <laughs> oh man, it's it's almost. I don't think I've I've never seen anything like it in all of Destiny. It brings you back to almost like when Sunbreakers in Taken King, except like that level of just raw power. Except this isn't just a super. It's 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 an entire. I mean, mm. what, what 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 do you think about stasis and crucible? I've seen a lot of talk about um, should Bungie some extreme cases of should Bungie just remove from crucible. I think more some more reasonable options would be like a playlist without crucible, which I think again backseat developing here could sounds doesn't sound I don't want to say it doesn't sound complicated, but it seems reasonable that Bungie could maybe add a playlist where only light subclasses. You know, law wise, it would make sense like a light mm. only, no darkness in here, and they could figure out a way to fit it in the law but do you think um yeah what, what do you think about that i think that uh i will refer to someone who is infinitely more knowledgeable about pvp um and that is true vanguard uh he basically stated like i do love the new season that's come out and i love a lot of the new weapons to grind for and that's all good but we cannot pretend that pvp is not a bad state like he says that we are in a potentially dark age of pvp and when TV oh, yeah, says agree. those words, you know, TV is not one to often yeah. um, use hyperbole. Mm -hmm. But when he says that, that shows how troublesome it really is. Yes, we've got new trials armor and two new weapons and one returning weapon. Great, cool. Yes, you made gilded titles for Unbroken and, you know, Dredgen and uh, Flawless. Like, yeah, cool. That's all good. Yes, you addressed Shatter Dive. Yes, the Behemoth is next up on the chopping block. But we still need a more of a focus on pvp because yeah no this is uh the pvp community is still very much hurting and that has mm. been the story for the last however many months um and, and that's only you this season as well exactly and that's only the most recent pain because to be brutally honest they were hurting prior to all of this with the overzealous auto rifle buffs that meant hard light was utterly dominant oh, in yeah. the meta you know like every season there has been something that hasn't been quite right and the changes that they're making, they still feel on the PvP front like they come in too slow. And this is coming from me, where my only exposure to PvP is the background noise I get on Twitter. But it speaks almost universally of the fact that these changes aren't fast enough. The actual Crucible sandbox is terrible, even though in PvE I'd say it's fantastic. Because, you know, you can't give one side of the thing's power, seemingly, without making that power also have to have some place in PvP. And that's a problem in and of itself. Yeah, it's it's just it's a really hard place to be. Oh, and now get this: Warlocks can throw down a stationary turret that shoots stasis. <laughs> I laughed when I and, saw and that. And that freezes and slows, and it's just <laughs> it's like. Is it any good? How, how is it? I haven't actually. Seen, I've seen it um, um, in in certain scenarios. I haven't seen it in normal. Haven't encountered it much in normal gameplay. What is it? Annoying? I've, strong? I've, is it? I've heard from I've heard different things from different people, but I've not heard as much of it as I think I would need to form the most balanced of opinions. What yeah. I do know is that the turret can be deployed um, and then will shoot alongside you, uh, not in the same way the knock buddy will, but very much as a stationary thing. Think of it like an acolyte's eye that shoots mm, stasis. Yeah, yeah but it and the stasis, is. yeah, on its own, those stasis bolts that it shoots can freeze you. And that in itself is going to be enough to drive some people completely and utterly insane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just another way that Warlocks can immediately ease, instantly freeze. You can do it now with a grenade charge, and you can do it with your staff. And even though they've reduced the timing on that to 1.5 seconds, which I think is actually, at least relatively speaking for Crucible, is a fair balance change. Oh my god, it's... <laughs> it's... Um, 
it is something. For yeah, when I saw that, it was just <laughs> <laughs> like after all the talk about about stasis, just seeing like, oh, just plopped it. You like stasis? Here's a stasis turret that fires more stasis at you. It's just hilarious. <laughs> but I mean, stasis it. as a whole, it's like we even talked about this before before Beyond Light came out. But it's freezing players is kind of a cardinal sin in PvP. Like to be frozen, I'm sure, I'm sure Bungie. I think it's you know it, it lends more lends more evidence to the to the to the opinion that Bungie doesn't really prioritize Crucible in the way that they previously have, and they don't really care about it being a serious, competitive, balanced environment. And clearly, by them adding stasis, it like it's just before it came out, I was wondering how how are they possibly gonna in in a game mode where movement is so important to be able to mm. just freeze someone? It's so jarring to just be stuck, to just be moving around, and then just it's, it, it, it removes control from your player and it's just something you don't see really ever in first person shooter games for good reason but it's right. I'm, I'm surprised that I'm, I'm surprised still that stasis is as strong as it is and I'm surprised that it hasn't been nerfed strong strongly but at the same time it's um, it's one of the core elements of, of, of Beyond Light so I guess they can't I think they kind of want to make it um, obnoxious and at least um have people talking about it because you know it makes people want to buy the buy, buy the expansion buy the new content i definitely think they want it to be powerful i don't know about I, 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 yeah it's definitely it definitely hits the bucket list of powerful but i think the sandbox team is in that really rough state of having to consider both pvp and pve and yeah. i mean the best example i think is the warlock melee range you know um on the staff they initially had it going really far out and then they nerfed it to quite short and yeah. now it's somewhere in the middle which mm. in all fairness considering they also slowed down the travel time i think is now somewhat more balanced than it used to be it's i still admit that you know i'm not a pvp guy so someone may come along and tell me that it's actually grossly overpowered and if that's the case like i concede to their greater knowledge on that fact but you know, the minute you nerfed the uh, melee range for PvP, you also did that for PvE, and I felt very kind of gimped uh, in that sense because it was one of these moments of like previously I've been able to use it to reach out as an opening part of the engagement, and then as I was doing this now with the nerf, it would just stop dead between the two of us and alert the enemies, and I'd lost all my advantage that previously I had gained. You know, like. Mm. This has real repercussions, and it's one of these moments where Bungie needs to consider very carefully what the right move is. Yeah. You know, for the record, even though it's um, even though it's one of these things that I would be uh, probably chastised for by people who are fellow warlocks, I'd be very okay if uh, everything in the Crucible, including Stasis Staff, unless it's literally like a glacier grenade where you are stuck inside the crystal as it forms, I'd be okay with every single one of those being converted to a slow of varying durations. Like, you know, get hit by the warlock stuff once, you know, slow for five seconds. A hunter shuriken, which is a little easier because there's less prime time and you just throw the damn thing, it travels very fast. Mm. Maybe make that a little bit um, less freeze time, but you know, but I'm very okay with that being the path they go because even if it's a slow, a slow is not as bad as a freeze. A freeze is just you've lost that gunfight. Even if you break out and fire back, you're already at like two mm. HP or dead. Uh, a slow at least gives a player a chance to react. And we've had slows in the form of smoke bombs before. So it does not feel like it's something that the Crucible would be able to completely and utterly get decimated by. Mm. That's just my take. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know about the uh take of somebody who's a true pvp sweat but you know I, I i like to think that we're all on the same page of uh as far as the crucible is concerned stasis is a problem as far as the greater thing of the game is concerned stasis is doing really well for the sake of expanding the power fantasy of players it is great in pve it is stasis mm -hmm. is amazing it is really fun so it's satisfying fun it. it's it's yeah. good pvp not so much <laughs> not so much I've seen um, there's been a lot of chatter around something that's been a lot more pain, painfully obvious this season, the leveling system, which, mm. um, you know, is nothing new. It's, uh, I said it before, it's it's antiquated, but as I also said, I think it's something that is 
very difficult for Bungie to do drastic change. I, I wouldn't expect to see any drastic changes to the leveling system anytime soon. As much as I wish they would, it's kind of it's kind of just a core part of the game. And hopefully they do some 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 tweaks to just make it less grindy. But just the power grind, doing milestones is especially like I always say, the more you've played the game, if you've been grinding milestones and grinding the power level, light level, whatever you call it gear score level whatever the various names it's been throughout destiny it's it's it feels like a massive grindy obstacle in the way of doing the fun stuff and i know there isn't a whole ton of content so bungie does it as a as a means to kind of uh, extend the shelf life of the season but i feel like the the, the you shouldn't the leveling um you, you shouldn't be having to power level that much in seasons i feel like maybe once or twice a year but in seasons it just feels like it's like oh again all right these milestones and tier ones and tier twos and infusing stuff and you got to check your level it just doing that four times a year is just exhausting and it's just yeah it, it's what most people are uh, kind of unanimous on but what are your thoughts on that yeah. i think that when it comes to leveling uh the replacement system for whatever it may eventually turn into needs to be designed by someone far smarter than i am um, take a lot of work yeah it's this is this is a this is a core structural problem of the game and Honestly, like if I'm looking for a quick fix, I'd say that we only grown twenty uh, power on yeah. uh, every other season. So like this season only twenty power, next season fifty, one after that in the summer twenty power, and then back to whatever it is for um, you know uh, Witch Queen, where you do grind a large number of power. Yeah, it's like sixteen hundred, I think, like two hundred levels or something. Right, something like that. I'm okay with. But um, if you're looking at what leveling is effectively stopping players from doing. Uh, it is effectively, or well, rather, let me rephrase that. If you're looking at what leveling is a band aid for, it's a band aid for both loot and encounter design. Um, so, to give you an idea of what I mean, um, players, if they're looking to stick around and play Destiny, play it for an incentive. And that incentive, more often than not, ends up being loot loot in either the form of a power increase or a gun that they really value. The thing is, Bungie needs to design guns that are valuable for encounters and allow them to really um, allow players to feel like they are powerful in a lateral sense. So I think a really um, good example of this is if you're trying to solo Shattered Throne. I have a hand cannon that I specifically leave aside for that, um, which has now been sunset. But I mean, assuming the encounter has not been brought up to light level, I'll still be able to use it. And it's a kindled orchid that has disruption, break, and shield disorient. And the reason I have that is because those two combo together, mm -hmm. along with a really powerful kinetic, to allow me to very quickly kill the wizards in that. Now, that's just one example, but it means that I'm chasing a role for a weapon that isn't predominantly rampage or multi kill clip or frenzy or any of these um, DPS increasing perks, you know, whether that's a reload speed increase or whether it's a damage or a rate of fire increase or something in between. Predominantly, you're looking for something that allows you to make a certain part of an encounter more doable. It allows you perhaps to exercise another part of skill. This is the two sides of the problem. They need loot that encourages that with perks that give people more opportunities to face unique encounters and unique bosses and unique enemies that need to be tackled in a certain way. Because right now in Destiny, I think the key problem is that everything that you fight, you know, for the most part, like it's not everything, I'll grant there's definitely differences for this, but a lot of things are damage sponges, you know? And that's not to say that they are the bullet sponges of the division or destiny one vanilla it's to say that the problem can be solved more or less by throwing a lament at it you know there isn't too much complexity to it it is admittedly done with damage gates which means you need to probably kill an ad or throw the thing at the thing or you know dunk the thing in the hole or whatever it may be you know there's there's a thing in the middle of the encounter that you have to do that is a mechanic but the encounters enemies themselves are in a very weird place where they don't necessarily encourage players to use an alternative strategy with alternative perks. So, and I, you know, I feel like Bungie is in a little bit of a bind there because this will always be a problem as long as they need to make mechanics and encounters simple enough for players to address. Um, like, really simple way of uh, summing this up is they need to compensate by creating more complicated encounters which then require better loot um, 
to address them and not better in terms of power level, but better in terms of having perks that allow players to be laterally more powerful. It's a very complicated way of saying it, but you know, okay. not everything should be a damage sponge and therefore not everything should be about how much damage you can do via how high your power level mm. is. Yeah, it's funny, funny you mentioned a uh, bullet sponge. That's a phrase that brings me back to 2014, 15. That was, uh, <laughs> that was one of the most common complaints and criticisms about Destiny, the term bullet sponge. It's kind of funny you'd obviously never hear it now, but yeah, mm. I guess most of the enemies were just a Valus to Arc, just a big, big, big tanky dude with a bunch of hell. But bullet sponges aren't really, they don't really exist now because the, the Lament <laughs> will carve through anything. This, this, if it's a bullet right. sponge, it's, it's going to die. Pretty much yeah we're at the healthy end of the spectrum which is things are killable um i'd say the healthy end of the spectrum as it gets harder is definitely things are killable but you need these tactics and this loot to do it mm. you know that's that i think is where destiny needs to go if it really wants to evolve itself and go beyond a power grind mm. you know champions are a very decent first step to that but i think that there are better ways of doing stuff um than just having champions. To give you an idea of, though, of that, the way that that changes things up, champions are good because they aren't just meat sacks that you can throw the lament at every single time and they'll win. Like, yes, you can do that with quite a few yeah, of them on the of. difficulties. But if you're in a GM, you are in a position where certain champions are going to require certain pieces of loot that are better than others. So one of my favorite examples is in a season where we have um, anti-barrier weapons on our primaries, Weapons that have disruption break, Vorpal weapon, and I think Genesis are actually better and more strategically valuable, as well as also loading holster. Um, because what you can do is you can break the champion's shield more easily or leave them with a debuff after having broken them. And that's the kind of lateral encounter design that I'm uh, trying to reference and trying to think of. You know, These weapons aren't good because they have a flat damage buff. Vorpal weapon is a very specific damage buff that happens to proc against champion shields. And you know, it's only 15%. It's inferior to Rampage on one stack. It's inferior to Multi-Kill Clip on one stack. It's inferior to Swash on one or two stacks, you know? Like, this is not a good damage buff on its own. But what it happens to do is it happens to be very specifically good against this one specific situation. And so having a weapon with it is really valuable. Similarly, can you imagine a boss where you would need to do damage over time to it. And therefore something like say a vortex grenade is a really great idea, but throwing a lament at it is immediately going to cause it to lock down or do something or, you know, spawn an attack that would immediately kill you in close range. It's one of these things of saying like, we need different ways of killing the boss and we need different ways of ensuring that as we kill the boss, it's, you know, not simply sitting there and, taking all this damage and just dying so quickly that there isn't any challenge to the mechanics of it. Mm. You know, that, that I think is the core of why um, things like, you know, people disagree with me. I know there are people that hate champions, um, but at the end of the day, like they do actually represent a shift in lateral power and they represent a shift in what perks actually mean you are generally more powerful in certain end game activities. Right. You know? Yeah. I'm not like, sure what the, what the what the general um consensus on champions i mean in my opinion i would say they're honestly one of my favorite things added in destiny to kind of full stop i think they're a really really good that's just my opinion but i think mm. champions are amazing they're such a it's such a unique just simple but powerful they're not cre it's obviously it's some activities they can be. Really but well. they're just they're, they're cool little mechanics and even the mods themselves I, I, they're so subtle but cool just having anti-barrier the, the ability to go through uh, hydra shields yeah. and phalanx mm -hmm. shields and uh night walls the uh disruption rounds just the ability to be able to stun and kind of slow down the enemies slightly mm -hmm. unstoppable doesn't have much of a use outside the champions except for i guess staggering but i i honestly the just itself i really okay. love mm -hmm. I, I really love the um anti-barrier and disruptor rounds especially they're, they're, they're subtle but cool and, it's, and the bosses as well they're cool they're very cool looking and they're intimidating kind of but there's a rhythm to them that like it's so satisfying when you when you know how to time an anti-barrier and you can put bullets into them reload or switch weapons you know he's going to shield and then you're in because obviously if you get the timing wrong pops a shield regens and kills you but when you get the timing right it's a, it's, it's I, I honestly think the champions and the mods are two of the best things two of the best things bungie have added definitely one of the best things about shadow keep i really like them honestly
And it's a great example of how those mechanics can work out because they aren't just meat shields and bullet sponges in that sense that happen to regenerate all their health unless you use this special thing. The mods themselves not only act independently as these things that can be useful against other enemies as a mod on their own, but they're also capable of creating opportunities. Like um, seasonal artifacts give us probably some of the best examples of this, but Spoils of War last season, finishing a champion giving heavy ammo um, just like a finder brick, is a huge perk which you can use as a resource. And people can use these perks that make them so powerful that they can actually solo Grandmaster Nightfalls using these particular perks. It's, it's really quite something when you have an enemy, but you can view them equally as a resource. That's quite something, you know? I can't remember what the uh, previous perks in previous seasons are, but I know that I've more than once been able to look at a um oh of course there are mods where if you break a champion's barrier or if you stun a champion it will regen an ability mm. and that in itself is a fantastic way of taking a Surgita, look at maybe there's something like sergita yeah something like sergita or just um i'm not sure the name something I know like that. there's, yeah there it's one of those is the best example that's the great one from last season sergita and um oh god there was that, one that was yeah, yeah there's two of them where yeah. it gives you back from the names yeah yeah, but you you take those abilities and you basically have a way of saying, like, this is not just an enemy. If you use it right, it's a resource. And just in the same way, you can design other enemies like that. And this all feeds back into that same question of how do you solve the leveling curve? And I'm, I you know, again, I'm not a developer, so I'm pretty sure that it is not as easy as what I'm saying. But I would love to think that it is... Um, that I'm correct in saying, at least, that it is bound up in both encounter design and in the variety of perks that you get, you know, like champions are a really great first step towards doing that and creating that lateral power um, that requires a player to have a variety of loot that they can use at their disposal. And even if this only ever happens at like the highest tier activities, like GM Nightfalls, I get that and that's fine. And I really do appreciate that that may be the only place where this can truly be a thing. If so, that's fine because that still solves our leveling debacle because you just don't level people up and you allow those hard endgame encounters to be the ones where that lateral combat approach is really required. You know, that's, I think, the uh, the potential forward destination for Destiny as far as creating mm. a new kind of leveling system is, you know? You aren't judged by how powerful your character is on light level. You're judged by how powerful they are based on what loot they have, which, you know, has always been a very understated thing in Destiny, I feel. Mm. So yeah, and on that simple, very small, simple thing, the fact that you can now put them onto exotics, very cool as well. Mm. Um, yeah. One of the, as far as the what we're talking about with loot, it's it's hard to ignore the overshadowing uh, issue, which is definitely making all the loot a lot uh, a lot more complicated. Sunsetting, of course, has uh, reared its ugly head once again, and a lot more of our loot has been stamped with that white stamp of death. It mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's definitely making itself a lot more apparent. Um I think I think um, I mean yeah there's there's, there's lots that, that could be said about sunsetting and we've covered it before but I think for the most part it just it it just devalues loot so much overall because it adds that expiration date to everything you get and everything cool that you get you know it's gonna expire which we've never had in Destiny before. Normally when you get loot. You could always just chuck it in the vault and you'd just be assured that it, maybe one day this, this will come in handy. Right? Like, Whereas yeah. these days it's like, I look at my vault and there's so much cool old stuff and it's always got the white stamp and it's like, yeah, I could use it in patrol and stuff, but it's just so much old stuff has been removed. And while, as we did say earlier, to Bungie's credit, there is a lot There is a lot of, uh, the volume of new loot is impressive although the volume of stuff that's being removed every season is kind of jarring. Like I lost all my, my entire set of um, perfect paradoxes, which is uh, upsetting. Right. I had just a, the full set of all the trench barrels and just it, it's easily one of my favorite weapons. I use it pretty much the entire year, but it's just like having those be removed without any good replacements. It does suck. And I think a year having everything expire after a year just seems just, just too much. I think just yeah. real to keep it brief. I feel like it's it sunsetting should have been a thing that happened once because it was supposed to mimic the transition between Destiny 2 and Destiny 3 which we mm -hmm. would have lost most if not all of our loot but the fact that 
it's happening every year and all of your loot you get it and you kind of know that in a couple of seasons it's going to be expiring uh, depending on when you get it and then there's also the, the just the mindset of grinding and getting lucky to get a piece of loot it just kind of devalues the whole thing when you know it's going to just expire and just kind of I don't know. It, it's a feeling we've never had ever in Destiny. This, this constant. It, it feels like loot's on a treadmill, and it's just gonna or or a conveyor belt. Even it's just gonna disappear. But it, it definitely does suck a lot of the um, a lot of the a lot of the motivation away from grinding for loot, and also just having good stuff. And yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, I think two things should have been done. They should have basically made it so that uh, contents you know, weapons and content get sunset after two years as opposed to one. Yeah. Because two years gives you a, yeah. a longer time to use the weapon, but also it's one of these things of it would have meant that we could potentially have sat there and seen things like the moon weapons and, you know, some of the stuff that we'd gotten in later seasons of Forsaken not immediately get sunset. Because can you imagine if we were still able to use menagerie weapons up until next uh, or up until two seasons from now? That would be amazing to still have some of those around for the upcoming seasons because i mean you know they, they really did cut back on the options we had for loot um by not including a lot of that stuff uh but aside from all of that i really do still feel like the conversation on sunsetting is still needs to be finished up like we need two more years until we have all the proof of the pudding because we still don't know exactly what the replacements of everything are going to look like i will grant however thus far it's not been good and Bungie really, like, even though there's a ton of great weapons, a ton of great new perks in this season, Bungie really needs to step up their game. Like, if they're going to give us powerful stuff that's only going to last a year, they need to start doing that pronto. Yeah. Like, I, I, you know, like, I'm really glad that we're getting powerful exotics because those are going to stay around forever. And that's fantastic. Like, we'll always have Taiku's Divination to kill Overload champions when Bow Overload is a thing. And that's always going to be something where we can just completely and utterly laugh in their faces. That's great. I love mm. that. Lament is always going to be great against barrier champions in certain scenarios because that thing does hella damage. But if they're going to start saying that we are going to have loot that is worthy of replacing things like the mountaintop and the recluse, we need to get to that loot pronto. And mm. there needs to be a lot of it because they have taken out, you know, we're at the inflection point right now. This is when it's going to be most painful. Yeah, They've taken out a lot and they've not been able to add back in everything that they might want to. So yeah, we need to hurry up with that. And in fact, I really hope that they uh, make a big push for this next season because next season we lose most of our ways of making Warmind cells. Mm. You know, after the next season and when the Warmind cell weapons do get sunset, we are then only going to have the possibility of making Warmind cell weapons with the Icolos weapons that we got in Season of Arrival uh, and with the um, Wrath, I want to say it's Wrath of Rasputin where Solar Splash damage can make a cell. Mm. Like, that limits our options significantly. Like, admittedly, you know, that's also going to disappear with the armor by the end of the season because Warmind Cells are a mod that appears on that armor. But, you know, we need to really think about what is going to come next. And I'm seriously hoping that we're going to see something very powerful. Like, it's totally not within the realm of what would happen in the story, but recently on Reddit, there's been, like, a SIVA weapon equivalent to Warmind Cells that's been circulating around that I've seen people share. And something like that... Where it's a unique mechanic to certain weapons that's just integral to it all that sounds amazing i'd love to see something like that make its way into mods and into the weapon system but they need to come up with something really really powerful whatever that ends up being i hope that it gives war mine cells a run for its money because it's got to be that so. yeah yeah you know? like war mine cells is by far one of my favorite things in destiny full stop right now it's all I ever use, Seventh, seventh Seraph, SMG, Warmines. It's just such, I've talked about it, Ignores him before, but like it's such a good mechanic. It's just so fun and weird and so ridiculously powerful. Um, yeah. So, so what that, when is that going to expire? Because obviously we're still getting the Seventh Seraph weapons, but is it the armor? The so, new armor is not going to accept the Warmind, the mods? Potentially not. Like, uh, or, as far as I know, actually, it when does. Is it going to go? Moment. But it's one of these things of it goes predominantly speaking when the weapons go. Like obviously there are still ways you can permanently make Warmind cells. Like Xenophage is explosive solar damage. And that means that you can use one of the mods as long as you can socket it into armor yeah. to always create Warmind cells. Like they're going to be around as long as you can socket the mods into the armor. But the, pr the main thing is that without any hassle, you can make them using Seraph weapons. And that... Uh, is what's getting sunset. You know, first we're going to lose the seven Seraph SMG. 
uh, the carbine, the sidearm, um, the saw, the machine gun. God, I hope they replace that wonderful thing. Uh, and then they're going to replace the Icolos weapons. So the sniper, the other SMG, and the Icolos shotgun. Like when all those get sunset, we're going to have significantly fewer warm mine cells in the actual sandbox. And it's going to be a very niche thing unless they do something new with that. Yeah. I, I, you know, I hope they make something new, in fact, and that this is just something which we only occasionally see because it would make it a really cool, like, strange build diversity thing. But, like, we need more variety and we need guns that are going to do a different thing, which is why I love that example of SIVA that someone has made in the community. Yeah. You know? That was, um, what, Season of the Worthy? They were, yeah, this time last year. Yeah. It's such a such a random feature they didn't even promote or and, and yeah. it took yeah. it took it's probably three seasons for season. for yeah. people to even figure out it was in the game. It was one of those things that only kind of niche players really knew about, but such a good mechanic. I absolutely cannot speak highly enough of all mine cells, and I hope they replace it with something equally interesting. Or yeah, just <laughs> just being able to stun an entire room blow. It's just it's just so right. cool. I, I love all mine cells six, for six energy. I could clear the entire room of ads if I was playing Spire of Stars yeah. just by blowing up a war mine cell for six energy in my armor. That's amazing. That's incredible utility. And if they're making new stuff like this in the game, I really do hope that they make it as powerful as that because, yeah, we, we need something like that. This, this, yeah. I just love the stun effects. Just being able to just, <laughs> just put that, that's, that's my, my go-to, just pop one bullet in it, and then it's just like every, everything in the room just calm down. Everyone just... Like you just in the right. middle of like twenty Stop enemies that. all shooting you, you just pop it and it's just like everyone silence, be quiet. Just everyone just and they're all just like ho hovering their eyes for like what is it twenty twenty seconds? A ridiculously long time. And then you just got time to reload and decide which enemy you want to shoot first. It's almost like um, it's like some kind of ability, like biggest, a Jedi or baddest, something. You know what it is? The biggest baddest blinding grenade. Yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, sunsetting is, it, it, it is cool to be, you know, that there is a sense of uh, something pushing you forward and something, it's a, it's a reason to try new stuff. But as we've said countless times, and as uh, many people say, we need good new stuff if you're going to take away our old stuff. And especially every year is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, Destiny, Destiny is, um, they've done a very good job streamlining it and making it very clean and condensed and simple. But um, clearly there's still obviously some work to go. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Um, yeah, that would definitely be definitely one of the negative sides. But as I've said, the story, there's lots of positives. The story is good. Um, the, just just the, the way the narrative fits in with the, with the seasonal gameplay of the battlegrounds, like it's, like I said, it's not um, it's not really pretending to be anything. It's not. It's an arena. You shoot a ball. It's not anything groundbreaking. But for what it is, it's a simple chill activity. Anything that's just match made that you can just load into, mindlessly shoot a ball, get a bit of loot. It's decent. So um, yeah, there's many strengths and still some still some areas that need need some work in this. But um, as always, we could we could talk for many more hours, but we should probably wrap this up. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's looking like a decent season. Uh, obviously, like with all seasons these days, it's um, it's on a drip feed, so there's going to be more to come. So it's would have been cool to get it all at once, but at least it's at least there's something to look forward to. There's more cutscenes and stuff coming up, so we'll see how that goes. And like I said, we'll be doing we'll be doing more of these podcast episodes more often. So um, definitely make sure you stay tuned for them. But um, thank you as always for joining me on this episode once again, Bife. Mm. Thank you for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. But yeah, hopefully you enjoy the episode. Um, as always, do all the all the algorithm stuff. Feed the algorithms, the like button on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, uh, check out the clips. Uh, if you made it this far, you're probably you, you, you probably enjoy the full episode. But uh, yeah, we got the clips. We got, of course, the audio versions on Spotify and Apple. Five stars, subscribes, all that stuff. But uh, of course, check out my good my good sir. My, uh, my name is Bife, if you want to actually learn about what's going on in the story. And he's got he's been pumping out a lot of content recently. So oh, dude, it's been a busy time. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Very exciting. But yeah, appreciate everyone for joining, listening, stopping by, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.